Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is June 10th, 2016, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, Americans have no right to carry concealed handguns outside of their homes. This, according to the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, which has ruled in favor of California's good cause requirement, which means the end of the Second Amendment. From my cold, dead hands. Then... The city of Cleveland wants to ban Trump supporters outside of the Republican National Committee, a move that even the liberal ACLU says is unconstitutional. Plus, more from Bilderberg 2016, where water cannons are being prepared by Dresden police in case protesters get out of control. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, here's another reason why you can't trust anybody when they say the science is settled. I mean, first of all, scientists obviously got it wrong by telling us all these years that there's only two genders. Clearly, according to Facebook, there's more than 40. (laughs) But here's another instance. There's a scientific paper that was conducted in 2013 uh, linking conservatives with psychoticism. And of course, when this came out, it was heavily... uh, published and a lot of papers were kind of laughing about it. Look, oh, uh, conservatives are uh, tied with authoritarianism while social liberals are linked with social desirability. So this paper was called Correlation, Not Causation, the relationship between personality traits and political ideologies. It was released in October 2013. So here the paper was claiming that uh, social liberals, they were linked with social desirability. Conservatives are authoritarian. Um, th- the researchers had expected that conservatives were more likely to exhibit traits of psychoticism, which they defined as uncooperative, hostile, troublesome, and socially withdrawn, as well as manipulative. And so their initial findings reported on just that. They said, in line with our expectations, psychoticism is associated with social conservatism and conservative military attitudes. And they also went on to say that people with uh, socially liberal ideas were more socially desirable. Well, it turns out three years later, the authors of the paper were had had to issue a correction because it turns out they mixed up the data in the code book. The data that you re, they were using between their code book and what they were using in their original code book was switched around. And in fact, these results were the exact opposite. The study found that liberals were more associated with being uncooperative, hostile, troublesome, socially withdrawn and manipulative. And it was actually the conservatives who were more socially desirable. Now, when contacted by the Washington Free Beacon, the authors of the paper said it was just a minor error in switching this around. So, of course, very minor detail there with labeling conservatives as psychotic. And in fact, it's the exact opposite. But if you've been watching the news lately, you already knew that. And as Leanne pointed out in that report, if you need evidence that liberals are the true psychos, all you have to do is go out to these rallies, whether it's pro this or anti that. I've been to countless rallies, whether it's abortion rallies or anti-Trump rallies or whatever else. It's these liberals, these a lot of them college students, uh, communists, socialists or whatever. They come out there, they're yelling at old people, trying to shove old men in the streets, uh, smashing eggs into girls faces, uh, burning flags, throwing barricades at cops, throwing rocks at each other. (laughs) That's the true psycho behavior. But as you talk about how they want to say that conservatives are the ones with mental illness, They also bring this up when it comes to firearms to the Second Amendment. And oftentimes when they talk about the Second Amendment, I hear this argument, if you own a firearm, you're responsible for the deaths of the uh, kids who die in school shootings, or you're responsible for the latest liquor store robbery or bank robbery. And to that I say, I was like, do you drink? And they say, yeah, I have a glass of wine or a a bottle of beer when I'm watching the game. I'm like, okay, with that same mentality that you just placed on me, I don't drink, so it's easy for me to pull out all the crime statistics when it comes to alcohol and try to ban something I don't participate in. So I say, okay, drinker, the fact that you have a bottle of wine or a six pack of beer makes you responsible for the next drunk driving incident. They say, no, you can't do that. I'm a responsible drinker. I I have a bottle of wine with dinner or I have a beer while I'm watching the game. I didn't go out there and drunk drive and kill somebody. I'm like, oh, you didn't? 
So my shotgun that sits in my closet hasn't killed anybody, so how am I responsible using your logic if you're not responsible for your activities? And this is the type of liberal logic that they put out there because they don't participate in the act of firearm ownership. Everybody else is collectively guilty. Even though if something was to happen, if somebody kicked in their door at three o'clock in the morning, they're not gonna call the, uh, they're not gonna call the ambulance, they're not gonna call the fireman, they're going to call the police officer. Why? Because the police officer shows up with a gun. That's why I have a shotgun in my closet, but let's say you're out in public and you don't have some big shotgun on you, you have to have a concealed carry permit if you choose to do so. I'm not running a campaign to put a firearm in every waistband in America, but I do believe if you are uh, applying by your state and local laws and they say you can have a firearm, I have no issue with that. But now we see this, the Ninth Circuit. Americans have no right to concealed carry a gun outside of the home. And this is the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit is ruling in favor of California's good cause requirement, saying the Second Amendment does not protect the right to carry a concealed gun in public. Now, this is the issue with this law. They say that you need a good cause, a good cause meaning uh, if you have a documented stalker or a rapist or somebody who's after you, they consider that to be a good cause because you may be attacked that day. But let me put it to you like this. If you have a spare tire in your car, you don't just put it in the days you think you may get a flat tire, right? You may occasionally take it out if you have to move or you need some additional space in your vehicle, but most of the times you leave it there, you forget about, forget about it and it's there if you need it. The same thing if you choose to carry a firearm. You don't know the day you're gonna be attacked or raped or mugged or whatever else somebody tries to shove you into a van. That's why you have the option to carry it on you at all times. And that's really what it's about. It's not about hunting. It's not about protecting your house at three in the morning while those are included in that. It's the second amendment as a whole. You have the right to defend yourself and your loved ones, especially uh, for people who live out in rural communities and they don't have uh, the cops be there all the time. Let's say you know, you're out somewhere out deep in the sticks doing whatever your business is and somebody tries to rob you, you know, it's going to take the cops, you know, 45 minutes to come and get to you. You know, some of these very small police offices and sheriff's departments only have a handful of officers and it's a very large county. You need the ability to defend yourself. That's why I strongly disagree with this uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, hopefully this will be overturned and it won't go too much further than what it is. But to say that you need to present evidence to them that you uh, are in danger, that, that's ridiculous. That's like saying we only need a lifeguard on Saturday or Sunday because those are the only days we suspect some kid may drown in the pool. You know, you need the lifeguard every single day because you never know who's going to be there. But that's enough on that, and we'll definitely have an eye on this as things continue. Now, one thing that has the eye of the nation is the case of the Stanford rapist. Now, for you guys who may not have heard about this, I'm sure it's just a very small number. Somebody's been convicted of raping an unconscious woman outside a fraternity house. And then he lied to the judge and told him that he had little experience partying prior to his arrival on campus. And it's not, my point with this article isn't so much was his sentence too light or too heavy. I think with uh, the condition they said with good behavior, he could be out in three months personally. I think that is very, very, very laxed, very light. Uh, but really the point I wanna make with this is the lack of accountability, once again, as we talk about a lot of these uh, college students, a lot of these leftists, and once again, I'm not knocking all college students. Uh, there's very liberal logic there, and a lot of people will grow out of that. But in the meantime, this guy is saying it's party culture that caused him to rape uh, this unfortunate young lady. And it's this lack of accountability, just like I referenced earlier, uh, whether it's people going out and rioting or doing other type of things. I'm mad at person X, so I'm gonna go out here and do something uh, negative that has nothing to do with person X. I go to a school where people are partying and uh, I feel like raping this girl, so that's what I'm gonna do. This is the, what the, this guy had the logic to do. It's completely ridiculous. The guy needs to be held accountable for his actions and you can't just blame society for everything else. Uh, <laughs> it, I, I just don't know how somebody justifies this. I, even uh, if he just wanted to get out of jail, I don't know how he could go in front of a stand in front of this girl's family and say these words out loud. It's completely ridiculous and uh, hopefully this, will bring somewhat of a bellwether where we talk, start to talk about these things and take these things a little more serious because there have been numerous examples of people who did serious crimes or similar crimes that got much stiffer penalties. You can find examples of non, non-violent drug offenders who got much stiffer, stiffer penalties than what this guy did. So uh, that's just 
one thing for the mind as we continue through the week and onto the weekend. Now, let's completely shift gears and talk about Mrs. Clinton. Now, Mrs. Clinton, people keep saying she's making history, and I do agree. Uh, to my knowledge, this is the first presidential nominee to go into the race who is being openly investigated by the FBI. So that I do believe she is making history in that. But a lot of people have this misnomer that she's making history for another reason, being the first female nominee of a party, and that is not true at all. Uh, there are even recent examples like Cynthia McKinney and Jill Stein, but if you want to throw it way back, back in the time, let's take a look at some, just a few of the female presidential nominees throughout history. Victoria Woodhull of the Equal Rights Party. Belva Lockwood. Also, we have Gracie Allen of the Surprise Party. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. So once again, if you think seeing Hillary in that spot is good for you, fine. If you, if you just want to see that, if you want to celebrate that, that's your business. But at the end of the day, she is not the first. She will likely not be the last. So just get over that. That is not making history. And then they try to spin it. And it's like, oh, well, she's the first nominee in a major party. I'm like, okay, so the other political parties don't matter because who says? You know, I think the Libertarian Party is just as important as the Republicans and Democrats. They may not have the... Uh, big donors and everything, and they may have done some stuff recently that I'm not a big fan of, but I think they're just as important as the Republicans and Democrats, even though they don't get as much publicity. And somebody who's getting a lot of publicity right now is Mark Cuban, the outspoken owner of the Dallas Mavericks, has said that he is willing to be a VP for either candidate. And this is what he said, Washington has become so partisan and gridlock is so bad that you need somebody that doesn't have the legacy of baggage of one party or the other. I think that both candidates are severely deficient in technology. Hillary has her challenges with email, and that is quite the light statement. <laughs> uh, Donald Trump doesn't even use email. I don't think they have a strong grasp of, of technology, and that's what's going to drive our economy. I think I can bring that value to both. So, yeah, I do agree that they probably don't really understand technology. I don't think, speaking of uh, one of Trump's policies, that we should have the government just build back doors into our technology so they can supposedly find some terrorists someday. As I said earlier, referencing the San Bernardino shooters, um, Libertarian John McAfee, who was in the race at one time, publicly told the FBI how to hack into the phone on live TV. If you had your uh, pen and pad and you got to step-by-step -step instructions, you could do the exact same thing that he was telling the FBI to do, but the FBI wanted to have this built-in technology, which uh, some people were championing. I don't think that's the right way to go. And that's just one of many, many issues. Uh, internet freedom, our power grid is severely linked in to the, uh, to the internet. So somebody could strategically shut down the power grid. There's a lot of different things that go along with technology. And of course, the new laws that are gonna be coming down the road that we don't even have a reference point for. For example, think about yourself back in, well, if you're around back in 1960, uh, you couldn't even fathom the thought that you'd have a smartphone app and what you'd have to do to regulate that. You know, So that's just, one type of thing that you'd have to deal with. Now, as I was speaking about Trump and his policies, at the end of the day, I support people's freedom of speech, I support people's uh, bill of rights, or whatever else. Also, that includes people's freedom of assembly. And now they're trying to somewhat censor Trump's rallies going into the RNC. Now, when you think about this, we've seen numerous instances of people coming out in you know, the thousands uh, to, to protest Trump but now when people want to have a pro-Trump rally, they're giving them 24 hours to register. And this is a Cleveland to ban Trump supporters outside of RNC. The city of Cleveland is attempting to suppress pro-Trump rallies during the Republican National Convention, a move that even the liberal ACLU calls unconstitutional. And as I said, they give you 24 hours to register for your free speech permit. And that's the issue I have, whether it's uh, this rally that's coming up or what you see at the universities. They say, hey, you can have your free speech rally, your free speech zone way over there, away from anybody, away from the cameras and you know, your little uh, little dirt square, little mud square that we say that you can set up shop in. We don't want you to be too loud. We don't want you to use a megaphone. We don't want you to hand out flyers, give away stuff in the United States of America. We don't want you to do anything like that. And that is a suppression of the man's free speech regardless of his politics. And they use that Hillary Clinton quote. I don't know if you guys saw that piece that Darren McBreen did the other day. But he had all these clips of all the talking heads saying the exact same 
talking point, the same line that regardless of Mrs. Clinton's politics, you have to observe the fact this is a historic moment. Like I said, she's being investigated by the FBI. I think that's pretty historic in and of itself. And as we're talking about demonstrations, usually what happens at Trump rallies is you have his supporters that are very peaceful, minus a few people who wear a Trump hat and conduct violence. And those things are few, far between. It's bad that it happens. They do happen. But once again, those things are completely dwarfed by the uh, Bernie supporters, by the anarchists, by the many other people who come out to places to kick up violence. And one place where they're not planning any violence, but they're preparing for it, is Bilderberg. We have our crews out there right now. And now they're starting to assemble water cannons and uh, other type of big MRAP type vehicles to deal with the crowds, these rabid crowds of, you know, a handful of protesters and journalists. And it's gotten so bad that they're even arresting people for walking around with loaves of bread saying that they can be used as a weapon. I'm, I'm being dead serious. This has been reported. They also were harassing a couple who had a cardboard sign. You can't have those cardboard signs. You may hurt somebody's feeling if they actually take a chance to read it. So we'll have the latest on Bilderberg for you next week. Now, moving quickly, USDA officials, please let people rely on food stamps. If you're on food stamps, I'm not knocking you. I'm just saying you don't want to be dependent on the government. You saw the uh, article, the video earlier this week of the woman freaking out when the food stamps didn't work. You don't want that to be you. Have some way to feed your family besides relying on the government. And lastly, now, U.S. media is being dominated by one Matt Drudge on a scale of over 100 media outlets, Drudge is number three. So congratulations to you, Drudge. And just in case you're wondering, Infowars.com is in the top 100. Well, that's it for this segment. Stay tuned right after this for more special reports on the Infowars Nightly News. Well, as you know, from our reporters, Paul Joseph Watson, Rob Dew, Josh Owens, Bilderberg is in progress this week in Germany, in Dresden, Germany. And Bilderberg is very concerned about keeping the European Union together. That's the monster that they created. And it is only an intermediate step to global governance. But of course, Bilderberg is focused primarily on Europe and North America. So they're going to be very concerned about Brexit. They don't mention it on their agenda that they're talking about. And of course, they don't mention Donald Trump either. But we got Lindsey Graham, the uh, essential establishment neocon, never Trumper who is there. I'm sure they're going to be talking about how to contain Donald Trump. They're going to be talking about how to stop Brexit. But the thing that they're really concerned about is the results of their globalism and the results that it's had on the people who are working, the people they call the precariat, the proletariat who are in a precarious position. And of course, this all harkens back to a kind of neo-socialism from these economists. So they like to break everybody down into simple class warfare, and that's what they're doing with this. But I wanna talk about their approach that they're taking and what the final end game is on this. And also, how they have combined, we now see that they're pushing in their final end game, a universal basic income to be provided to everyone. Now that sounds like socialist utopianism, doesn't it? Would you be surprised to find some of the most conservative libertarian think tanks, like the American Enterprise Institute, thinkers like Charles Murray, who wrote Losing Ground in 1984, would you be surprised to find them pushing that idea? You see, the left and the right is a false dichotomy that they feed you, to control you. Remember, we've talked about this multiple times at InfoWars, how it was the German central bankers who sent Lenin to Russia on a train with $10 million in gold to start the communist revolution. Well, we're at the beginning of a, another kind of revolution like that. But first, let's take a look at their approach and how they're gonna to try to stop Brexit. Now, this is an interview with the German finance minister, Wolfgang Schabel. It's going to be released on Saturday in Der Spiegel. It has 23 pages that are published in English. This is a German paper, of course, but they want to send a warning to the English people. They say, the finance minister warns that a British withdrawal from the EU could also negatively impact Britain's partner countries. And he says, in response to them, he says, we would have to see it as a wake-up call and as a warning not to continue with business as usual. Schauble also ruled out the possibility that Britain could again enjoy advantages of the single market like non-EU members, Switzerland and Norway do, after leaving the EU. In other words, Switzerland and Norway get to participate in trade deals with the uh, European Union, even though they aren't officially European Union members. They have a limited uh, association with them, but they still get to participate in that. But if Britain were to come out, Schauble, the German finance minister, warns them that's going to be it. He says, aus ist aus. If you're out, you're out. 
we're going to punish you economically. That's what they put in English in the German language paper. That's the warning they put out. And this, here's what he says. It would require the country to abide by the rules of a club from which it currently wants to withdraw. Brexit, he said, would be a decision against the single market. In is in and out is out. Okay, so they're going to punish the British people if they do that. And so we're in a situation right now where you have to understand if you're British, and this is, goes for everybody in Europe, okay, this is a war against your sovereignty, against your country. And essentially, he's just declared it. Are they going to go the way of Neville Chamberlain or Winston Churchill? Will they follow the path of appeasement, hoping that they can sue for peace and prosperity? Or will they understand that they are in a war for their very existence, that if they don't fight this European United States of Europe that the Germans tried so hard so many times to create, that uh, they're going to lose their freedom and their prosperity. And of course, we've even had uh, Prime Minister James Cameron say, hey, if we get out, it's going to lead to war. It will lead to war. It will lead to an economic war. They're threatening them, saying that this is going to be an economic warfare at the very least. The same banks involved in rigging the LIBOR exchange, the London interbank uh, rates that are used to set variable rate mortgages, they were rigging this. And now they're saying they're going to increase the mortgages. Of course they will. They'll rig those as well. These are also the same banks like HSBC that have been involved in money laundering for terrorist organizations and drug cartels and get away with doing it all. So that's where it's all coming to eventually. But as we've been talking about this entire week, when we talked about the billionaire space race, when we talk about what's going on with Brexit, when we talk about what's going on with the precariat, you need to understand all of these forces are coming together like the Ardalek War that Hugo de Garris talked about. If you remember that briefly, he said there's going to come a time when people understand these disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence has a potential to destroy their lives if it doesn't result in machines who try to essentially take over and kill the humans, it will destroy every other aspect of their life. He says at this point, the Luddites, the Terrans, will get together. He calls them the Terrans who stand for the earth. They will get together and they will try to shut down these forces. But the cosmos, he calls them, the elite, the plutocracy, the billionaires, they will remove themselves to space, to space colonies, to near space, uh, to near earth space colonies. And from that advantage point, and from the advantage of their technology, they will pursue a war that will result in giga death. The economic war has already started. The precariat already feels the boot of these people on their throat. So the question is, is it going to continue? And what is their economic end game before we get to this other end game? I find it very interesting that the same person who has popularized this, Guy Standing, the socialist economist, wrote a uh, op-ed piece recently in the Singularity Hub. Again, this all ties together, the technological singularity and the globalism and what is happening with this billionaire space race, all of these tie together. And he talks about the growing precariat, why we need a universal basic income. And he begins by talking about the Luddites. Again, we're back to the Terrans, the Luddites who oppose this disruptive technology. He says in 1809, the Luddites destroyed the machines that were seen to be putting them out of work, okay? the same analogies that Hugo de Garris pointed out. And he goes, jobs are indeed being destroyed. And the Jeremiah's, in other words, the prophets calling doom, are out in force. He says, the end of work, they shout, jobless growth. Well, what would you call it when 95% of the people don't have a job? And that was precisely what is behind all of these calls for a universal basic income. He says, what is happening is potentially generating a dystopia of socially unsustainable inequality in which a growing share of the population will be ruined in chronic insecurity through no fault of their own. And this tiny plutocracy of billionaires will coexist with a dwindling solitariat. Again, they like to break everyone into competing classes. And just like these other socialists, they want to focus on the equality of results, not on equality of opportunity. You see, when they talk about the precariat, they talk about this dangerous class of people, uh, this catastrophe, they say it creates a uh, climate where you can have political extremism be birthed. And of course, that's why they look at uh, the Brexit, they look at the rise of these parties to oppose open borders throughout Europe. They look at Donald Trump, they say anything that opposes globalism, you understand, they're going to label that as extremist, as racist. But just look at how they're operating in terms of bringing in people. Here's Forbes magazine talking about how universal basic income is not crazy. 
And referring again to the uh, Swiss uh, referendum that was just this last weekend, where 77 percent of them rejected this. They go back to Charles Murray. Charles Murray, who said, welfare creates dependency. His book, Losing Ground, was the basis of all the welfare reforms that we had during the Reagan administration. But now he says this, a practical response to the supply chain driven reality of our impending jobless future. The disruptive technologies that we've been tracking and planning and sourcing and manufacturing and logistics will eliminate work faster then new modes of employment can absorb the bodies, okay? There's going to be fewer employees, so what do we have to do? We have to get everybody on a constant salary. We have to make them dependent. See, dependency is not doing anybody a favor. Dependency makes you a slave. It's not an exaggeration to say that you'll be their slaves. They admit it themselves. Guy Standing, who wrote the book, The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class, says this. Do not think that the new precariat will just be unemployed in the conventional sense. An irony of recent labor market development says that the precariat has to do more and more work, much of which is unrecorded, unrecognized, and unremunerated. If you don't get paid, then you are simply a serf, a slave. They're going to put you on the reservation. That is what's behind Bilderberg, the billionaire space race, and all of this crony capitalism that's coming together. Entschuldigung, Herr Tillich, dürfte ich Ihnen eine Frage stellen. Ähm, ich wollte Sie gerne fragen, was Danke. Sie bei der Bilderberg-Gruppe machen. Danke, ich was Sie, vielen Dank. Haben Sie, Danke, haben Sie dort eine Rede gehalten bei der Bilderberg-Gruppe? Ja. Treffen Sie sich mit dem Bilderberg-Meeting? Eine Frage. Was ist denn? Is it going to be bringing more migrants into Germany? Mr. Tillich, one question. One question, Sir, real quick. Why do you sell out our country to lobbyists that are paid with our tax money? Rob Dew reporting for Infowars.com on location in Dresden, Germany. Just over here is the Grand Hotel Taschenberg Palais, where the 2016 Bilderberg meeting is taking place. Now, last night, uh, thanks to some tip from f some local reporter activists, uh, Max Bachmann and Tillman Knetchel, we were able to get the governor of Saxony on video saying some pretty incriminating stuff. Paul Joseph Watson is here now as well. Paul, come on in here. So what exactly uh, did uh, Mr. Tillich say, Stanislav Tillich is his name, he's the governor of Saxony. Well this is huge because the mainstream media always says that Bilderberg is just a talking shop, no decisions are made, they have no influence whatsoever. What's big about this is that he admitted that he came here to attract investment into the city of Dresden. That's the very definition of lobbying. We, we say over and over again, this is a lobbying organization, you've got corporations, you've got heads of government, you've got politicians scheming for lobbying purposes and in many countries that's illegal and he brazenly admitted it he also said he's going to be sitting you know 100 feet away from the top senior members of Bilderberg and that he you know hopes he will get a chance to talk to them again showing that there are tears within Bilderberg some people don't really know what it's about there you know they're delighted to be invited to it whereas the upper echelons know exactly what they're doing they're the ones planning the future of the world but for him to admit that he was there for lobbying purposes is huge, and it remains to be seen if he'll be invited to the conference tonight. So, Paul, he's essentially sitting at the kids' table at Bilderberg uh, looking for table scraps. Anything that the elites might throw down to him, he could grab up for the city of Dresden. Uh, is that essentially what's going on? Yeah, that's what's going on, and some of these people are also groomed. We've seen people rise up through the ranks. You know, Tony Blair came in 94. He became the uh, leader of the Labour Party a couple of years after that, then went on to become prime minister. So they can start as underlings, bowing and genuflecting to the Bilderberg elitists, the likes of Kissinger, you know, de Castries, the executive level members, and they rise up through the ranks. I don't think he'll be rising up through the ranks because he committed the cardinal sin, which was to talk about Bilderberg, and that is completely off limits. So he's going to be in trouble. 
Right, and uh, another governor from Arkansas also came to the Bilderberg meeting, I believe, in 90 or 91, and then became president of the United States. That was uh, Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton. And now one thing I want to give a, a shout out to the local uh, reporter, activist reporters who helped us get this, that was Max Bachman, who basically with his schoolboy charm was able to get Mr. Tillich on camera inside a church just around the corner from here talking about all this, basically getting him to spill his guts, uh, admitting the information we've already known, but it's always great to have one of these members actually just lay it all out for us. So it makes our job a lot easier as far as I'm concerned. And we've got more leaks coming soon. This article is up on Infowars.com. We've got the article about the economic collapse that they're planning, which is up on Infowars.com, and more leaks to come today. So stay tuned. That's right. We're really interested in the role of Lin Lindsey Graham. This, I believe, is his first trip to the Bilderberg meeting. He's a sitting U.S. senator. In violation of the Logan Act, he's going to be coming here. We don't know what he's going to be talking about, but we can imagine, and I think I have a, a hunch, that he is going to be trying to thwart a Trump presidency, maybe getting together with Vernon Jordan and James A. Johnson, both who run uh, high-end capital uh, lobbying groups, capital firms that basically are investment banks that uh, are democratically run. So I think they're going to be looking at ways to channel this money into a Hillary Clinton campaign to basically thwart a Trump presidency. Hey, Rob, do with Infowars.com. We've just made a discovery from one of our local contacts, Jim Johnson. We're going to speak with him in a second. But look over here. We have police trucks with, uh, it looks like water cannons mounted on top. So we're going to go get a closer look. And they've got, it looks like the scoops. Those of you who remember uh, Soylent Green, the scoops are on their way right here in Dresden, Germany. The scoops are on their way. The scoops are on their way. The scoops are on their way. I repeat, the scoops are on their way. These are just, uh, this is just a few blocks away from the site of the Bilderberg meeting taking place in Dresden, Germany. Uh, this is the top of the church last night where we confronted uh, Mr. Tillich, Stanislav Tillich, who is the governor of Saxony. So we're very close. On the other side was the square where we did the Pergida event. So we're very close by to everything. They've got, it looks like the scoops. Those of you who remember uh, Soylent Green, the scoops are on their way right here in Dresden, Germany. The scoops are on their way. We also have which looks like a... Uh, kind of a bastardized uh, LRAD system. A lot of loudspeakers, probably to scare protesters off. So here we go, we got two giant water cannon tanks ready to go after protesters. We have the scoop, we have uh, some sort of an LRAD system being developed. Uh, Jim Johnson, why don't you come on in here? You, f you found this this morning just walking by. Yeah, that's actually I came here because I wanted to get some uh uh, cards for my telephone to be able to take some video of the protest actions later and I just happen to see these here. Amazing and you talked to uh, the guard and what did he say? Yeah he said there was just some kind of a protest uh, that was supposed to be going on um, and these were here in case things got out of hand. Yeah so there is an anti-Bilderberg protest being planned for Saturday. There have been several going on very small uh, unorganized but as you can see here the police are expecting something big probably through their intelligence services through Facebook or, uh, or Twitter or whatnot but yeah they have once again the scoop this green scoop here ready to pick people up maybe and throw them in the back like what they did in uh, Soylent Green um, a LRAD vehicle right here with loudspeakers on it and then we have these two water cannon tanks these are giant systems let me go stand in front of it you can see how big they are I mean these things are giant how you doing sir American media, how are you? Are you from Germany? From Germany, Deutschland? Yeah. All right, so you can see these are pretty tall. Um, it looks like they have, uh, I'm not sure what these are. I guess these are cameras mounted on the front so they could see around all sides. They have the emblem of the country on them. Brand new, brand spanking new. Looks like these things haven't seen much action, unlike the Millennium Falcon. And then you have, uh, looks like the water cannons on the back. You have a camera on the back. So these are definitely anti-protest battle tanks ready to come out and take on protesters. Now, we've seen two people arrested so far in this incident. We've seen uh, a couple from England. What were their crimes for being arrested? The first infraction was having a cardboard sign, okay? One of them had a cardboard sign that says, um, uh, what do they have to hide? The other one said, this sign will be confiscated. Those signs were confiscated. Their second offense, carrying a loaf of bread, which said they, the police said could be used as a weapon. Now their third and final offense, having a tent. So having shelter in the city of Dresden is unallowed. They, they don't want people to have these. Uh, hey, are you guys from Dresden? 
So what do you think of these tanks uh, that they have parked here for the protesters? Uh, I don't know anything about it. You don't know, do you know about the Bilderberg meeting? Yes. Yeah, you know about it? What do you know? Uh, not much. Yeah. Uh, just a meeting between important people. Yeah. Yes, nothing more. Yesterday, we talked to the governor of Saxony, uh, Mr. Tillich. Stanislav Tillich, and he admitted that is uh, it is essentially a lobbying group and they like to meet in secret because they're figuring out ways to uh, divert money to different channels. Do you think that's something our government officials should be doing? <laughs> I don't know anything about this. Yeah. Yes. Well, you should learn. Bilderberg.org is one place, also Infowars.com. You should learn more about the Bilderberg group because these people are meeting right now in your backyard, one of which is a war criminal, Henry Kissinger. Okay. Yeah, no comment? No comment. All right. Well, you have a good day, sir. Look up the Bilderberg Group, okay? They're doing a lot of things behind the scenes, and our government officials should not be meeting behind the scenes in private meetings while we, using our tax dollars, have to pay for their multi-million dollar security. Like this. You're paying for this right now. Two water cannon tanks and a scoop and a loudspeaker vehicle. These are all ready for protesters. They fear people talking about this so much they have to get out tanks to stop protesters. Does that seem like a democratic society? Uh, no society I know is a democratic society. Ah, you're right. Because they're all really run in secret. That's, you're exactly right. You hit the nail on the head. It's the old adage, as California goes, so goes the country. It should be the red alert harbinger of the U.S. Constitution destroying and criminal presidential campaign of Hillary Clinton, because California has officially crossed the line. On Thursday, a federal appeals court in California ruled the Second Amendment does not permit Americans to carry firearms in public. The ruling upholds a California law that imposes strict rules on individuals who wish to exercise concealed carry. The California law requires applicants to demonstrate good cause for carrying a weapon. How's this for good cause, California? 14 dead and 22 wounded in a terrorist attack in San Bernardino on December 2nd, 2015, after every Homeland Security firewall was easily breached. Or the incident back in March of 2016 when, as WorldNet Daily reports, deputies from the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office and other agencies responded to a report of Allah Akbar chanting, turban-wearing men shooting assault rifles, handguns, and shotguns in a remote desert area. Or the fact that illegal aliens commit 30% of murders in many states. As Breitbart reports, criminal aliens accounted for 38% of all murder convictions in the five states of California, Texas, Arizona, Florida, and New York, while illegal aliens constitute only 5.6% of the total population in those states. Meanwhile, Mexico is crushing under the weight of the mass exodus California bound and saying they have reached their limit. Kurt Nimmo writes, the unconstitutional ruling strikes down a previous decision. In 2014, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in Peruta versus County of San Diego that the right to carry a firearm is guaranteed by the Second Amendment. Regardless, Judge William A. Fletcher declared, based on the overwhelming consensus of historical sources, we conclude that the protection of the Second Amendment, whatever the scope of that protection may be, simply does not extend to the carrying of concealed firearms in public by members of the general public. A dissent by Circuit Judge Maria Callahan warns the ruling will have detrimental impact on the Constitution. Judge Callahan writes, Constitutional rights would become meaningless if states could obliterate them by enacting incrementally more burdensome restrictions while arguing that a reviewing court must evaluate each restriction by itself when determining its constitutionality. The decision establishes a precedent for future challenges to the right to concealed carry and will embolden efforts by the government to dilute and eventually render the Second Amendment meaningless. Ben Shapiro, writing for the Daily Wire, argues, incrementalism is the explicit goal of the left, 
Of course, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama will never say they want to ban all firearms. Instead, they'll just destroy the right to bear arms piecemeal. They'll say you have no right to open carry, you have no right to concealed carry, and you have no right to have guns in the home. In case you hadn't noticed, incrementalism is the modus operandi of the New World Order agenda. What sounds impossible now, by a thousand cuts, will be a reality tomorrow. And then that old adage will be modified to, as the Second Amendment goes, so goes the country. I'm going to do everything I can to rally people <coughs> against this pernicious, corrupting influence of the NRA. I was proud when my husband took them out, and we were able to ban assault weapons, but he had to put a sunset on. So 10 years later, of course, you know, Bush wouldn't uh, agree to reinstate them. When ordinary hands can possess such an extraordinary instrument, that symbolizes the full measure of human dignity and liberty. From my cold, dead hands. John Bell for Influence.com. Ramadan's happening right now. I am a proponent of the Constitution. One of the most important amendments is freedom of religion. I'm not saying I'm anti Islam or Muslim. What I'm saying is that there is a point where Islam cannot coexist under Sharia law with the Constitution. And as Ramadan is going on, it's, it's a time for you to reflect on the things that you do within your religion, your respective religion of Islam. Uh, people are forcing that onto other people. So wh whether you're Amish or you're a Jesuit or you're a Catholic, um, if I'm a Catholic, which I'm not, but if I were, uh, so maybe I'm going to give up red meat during Lent. I'm not going to walk around a restaurant and take waitresses' face and spike them off the ground because they're serving red meat. That kind of goes against the idea of freedom and liberty, right? Doing whatever I want. But if you have somebody that, in enforcing Sharia law, that's not supposed to be, you know, drinking alcohol, for example, is serving alcohol and then takes that waitress and throws her face on the ground, like happened this week, we have a problem. We have a big problem. You have no right to tell me how to live my life. If I wanna drink alcohol during your time of, of respectful consideration, let me drink my alcohol. If I wanna be respectful of your religion, I'm not gonna drink it around you, that's my choice. That's how I roll. But if you think you're gonna come over here and, and you know take one of, or tell my daughter or my wife that she's not allowed to wear a bikini at the beach because it goes against the, the principles of your religion during this time of, of reflection, we're gonna have a big problem. That's the whole idea of, uh, about liberty. It's that I get to do things that you may not like and you just gotta live with it. You might do things that I might not like. Listen, I'm totally okay with you not drinking during all of Ramadan. I'm not gonna tell you that you need to drink alcohol. But if you come and tell me that I can't, I'm going for a ride. Listen, freedom of religion is key. It's vital and important. Don't force your beliefs onto me or to anyone else. Live your life, do your thing, but you start encroaching on my freedom, gonna have a big problem. Well, that's it for our show tonight. We do encourage you to go to prisonplanet.tv. We can get the nightly news, the special reports, the rants, all right there. You can get yourself a free trial at prisonplanet.tv. Now, if you guys see our reporters in the field, we got guys in Bilderberg, had guys in California. I was out in Albuquerque. We have guys going all over the place all the time, and this is what helps fund our operation. I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again next week. The Federal Reserve is a private banking cartel. The yeah, Fed is a sometimes very independent uh, organization. What should be the proper relationship between the chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? The Federal Reserve is an independent agency. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. They print our money and then loan it to us at interest. The IRS is their collection agency. So long as that is in place 
and there is no evidence that the administration or the Congress or anybody else is uh, requesting that we do things other than what we think is the appropriate thing, then what the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. Jeff Duncan says he saw IRS special agents using semi-automatic rifles at a gun range. Now he wants answers to why the agency needs that type of firepower. Is this global governance at last? Is it one world? The central bank is in charge. Know your history and you will know your enemy. Infowars.com. I'm